fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Today we have uh, two guests that uh, we're going to be talking about um, the history of the United States before 1974. And we're going to be talking to, um, let's see, we've got Kevin Cruz and Julian Zelizer. Thank you for being here. Great to be with you. Okay, now um, let's start out, just to let people know who you are, let's start out with uh, Kevin. Uh, maybe give a little bit of background about who you are and uh, what you do. Sure, I'm a professor of history at Princeton University. I've been there since uh, 2000. I specialize in political history. I've written books on um, segregationist and religious nationalism, and uh, with this book, uh, have um, moved into the modern era. Okay, and and Julian, um, let's talk about you. Yeah, I'm so I'm a historian, also at Princeton, a colleague of uh, Kevin, and I've written a number of books on really presidents and Congress since the '60s. Uh, my last book was on the Great Society. I wrote a book also about congressional reform in the 1970s, and I, I also wear another hat as a political commentator. I'm on uh, CNN, and I write for them as well as The Atlantic. So studying really all parts of American politics uh, from the 1960s right through today. Great. Now, what what got you guys interested in this late, latest project? And I know you're also... Um, trying to make people aware of Trump and and how how to stop something like that from happening again. Um, maybe, uh, um, Kevin, you want to take that lead? Sure. So, uh, again, when I started at uh, Princeton in 2000, I uh, started teaching a course that had been there for a couple decades. I was titled uh, The U.S. Since 1920. Uh, I think it was designed in, like, 1960, um, and so it stayed on the books, and uh, obviously that a period covered a lot more ground as the decades went on. And uh, when Julian got to Princeton, uh, less than a decade after me, uh, we looked to uh, break that course in two. And and to really to start thinking about these last four decades, these last four and a half decades, really, uh, not as they've always been taught as a kind of, uh, you know, postscript to the uh, to the story of, 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 uh, of the mid-20th century America, but rather to take them on their own terms and really to think about, okay, this is an area that really had, does have enough time, enough events in it to, to really think about it as a discrete period of history. How do we think about this period if we think about it on its own terms and not just as an afterthought to what happens in the 50s and 60s, but what happens from the 1970s to today that makes that period uh, unique and important? So what is it about the 1970s? So your latest book starts with 1974. So so what's so important about that year, and what makes it what makes that post 74 era different than than the years that came before it? Well, there's something uh, specific in 1974 that we use uh, to start the story, and and that's President Richard Nixon resigning from office, which is a major moment in American political history. And when he resigns, in some ways, uh, he brings up all the different tensions that have been building up in the United States uh, over issues from uh, Vietnam, the war in Vietnam, to the uh, strength and legitimacy of presidential power. Uh, but during the 1970s, the country goes through a, a series of major crises where uh, some of the foundational aspects of the United States uh, since the 1930s are challenged. Uh, the first is our political system, uh, where you have growing distrust of government and sweeping efforts, really, to reform the way that our political process works. In the economy, you see the uh, falling apart of the union 
based manufacturing sector of the economy, which had been really the heart and soul of uh, of our country uh, from the uh, again 30s through the 1970s. You see increasing divisions over race relations, uh, tensions that are different than the ones in the 60s, but centers on questions of institutional racism. And finally, all sorts of debates open up about issues of, of the family, about feminism and sexuality. And all of this takes place in a tumultuous decade, the 70s, that often have been treated as a, a footnote between the 60s and the 1980s. So, so that's why we root the story in that decade. So, but don't, but wouldn't you say that a lot of these issues that you're bringing up have been around long before 1974? And I, I, I mean, I, uh, I mean, again, I want to push, push you on this point. Like, why 1974? I mean, there was, there was discontent over Vietnam and about the president's war making power prior to that. I mean, race relations, I think, have been getting better rather than worse. Um, even though they've, they've changed over time and, and issues of gender had been, um, you know, getting addressed for, you know, for a long time at that point. So, so, so why the mid seventies? I mean, uh, I mean, I guess he, 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 I guess you're right when you point out everyone talks about, oh, the, the 1960s and all the changes that occurred there, but, um, um, I, I, I guess I'm still looking for that why 1974. Well, it's not that we are arguing that 1974, everything turns on a dime, uh, but rather, as Julian noted, there's a series of shocks to the, to the, to the system there that if you're looking for any kind of breaking point, uh, that period really does stand out. So think about just between 1973 and 1975. Again, not just in terms of uh, Nixon's resignation and the Watergate scandal, but you've got Roe v. Wade in 1973. You've got the busing crisis over uh, over over race and residence uh, that really blows up Boston in 1975. You've got um, uh, the oil crisis, uh, the embargo in 1973, which really uh, starts to cripple the economy. You've got the slow uh, retreat from Vietnam from 1973 and the peace treaty to 1975 and the withdrawal. So in the span of just two years, the country's political establishment is shattered. The economy seems to be on the ropes. Foreign policy is falling apart. Uh, and so, as yes, you know, all these things, and we talk about this in the book, all these things are changing over the previous decade. But there's a real moment of rupture in 73, 74, and 75, which really does uh, bring that old order uh, to its knees and open up new possibilities. And what's different here, again, in that before and after moment is that in that post-war period, you really had uh, uh, not just these lines of division, which, as you know, had always been there, but there are, in this earlier period, forces pushing against those lines of division. Uh, again, the, uh, the, the uh, post-war economy is thriving. Industry is booming. There are a lot of union jobs, a strong union movement that is lifting people into the middle class. You've got, uh, in terms of politics, uh, the parties are much more ideologically diverse, which leads them to work to bipartisan solutions uh, just out of necessity. In terms of the media, you've got uh, a really almost monolithic mainstream media. You've got the big three TV networks, a handful of major metropolitan newspapers that are really setting the course for the country. So, yes, there had been divisions in this earlier period, uh, but there had been these forces uh, pushing against those divisions, uh, kind of centripetal forces holding the country together. Uh, we don't have that uh, in the period after 1974. So you, you mentioned one thing uh, about post-1974, and that's about, you know, you open up this this – uh, era for new possibilities. What are those new possibilities that, that came in after that period? Well, certainly in, in terms of, of uh, political movements, every, every era has certain political movements that really shape the national debate. And you see that right away in, the, in, in this decade. The, the probably major, the major force, the major grassroots uh, presence that we talk about is the conservative movement, which is a coalition of different groups from the religious right uh, to neoconservative Democrats who break with their party on foreign policy, who start to find common ground uh, as a political movement in an alliance with the Republican Party and come together politically really in 1980 with the election of Ronald Reagan. And they'll achieve many different uh, objectives, during the period that we study, they, they helped to shift 
national debate to the right. They have many successful initiatives on policy, uh, including tax cuts and deregulation, for example. Uh, and so that's a possibility that really seems to open up uh, in the middle of this crisis for this new voice in American politics. And there are also new voices on the left uh, from the liberal side that find space in this crisis. And one of the first ones we trace uh, on that front is the feminist movement, uh, which really by the 70s is starting to raise questions from the Equal Rights Amendment uh, to sexual harassment at the workplace that had been left off the agenda really before that period. So, so simply in terms of social movement politics, it's pretty remarkable the number of new voices that are coming front and center. And then in another realm, you see new possibilities in areas uh, such, as, such as technology. And we try to cover the emergence of the personal computer uh, and how that changes communications and it changes the way we do work and the way we do business. Uh, so those are just two examples where um, the, the country is very dynamic, even in a difficult moment. So I think one thing that always shocks me when I look back at that era is that you have a, a sitting president stepping down due to a lot of wrongdoing, and then you have the election of Carter, and you would have expected Carter to do fairly well and to perhaps get reelected, but um, you would not have expected what happened in 1980 to have happened in 1980 with, with, with Reagan. Um, a person who was probably more conservative than his party at that time and a member of the party that, you know, of, of Nixon. So so what do you think some of the forces were that sort of brought that around and how does that play into your book? Well, it, it is really surprising to see Reagan win in 1980 for a lot of people, especially given where we start the book, where it seems like the Republican Party has been thoroughly discredited, not just by Nixon's, uh, actions in Watergate, but by the support of party elders for Nixon, including President uh, Gerald Ford, who pardons Nixon uh, in what he thinks is going to be a healing move to the nation, but actually only uh, further polarizes it. People uh, charge that Ford had uh, been part of some kind of corrupt bargain. Uh, so the entire Republican Party is really tainted. And what Reagan does is he manages to uh, lead it out of the wilderness. Uh, and he does so um, um, by staking out very bold, uh, clear uh, policy positions. Uh, he, he, he overcomes the what he had decried as the, the previous mushiness of Republicans uh, to, to, to stake a claim to conservatism. And instead, he says he's going to campaign not in, 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 in pale pastels, but in bold primary colors. And that he does. Uh, and he's aided here by the fact that there have been different groups on the right that had really been working uh, to build up uh, new constituencies, to try new methods of reaching out and getting people involved in politics across the 1970s. So you've got uh, the new right with its uh, limited government anti-tax message, which Reagan is really a, a part of, and then allies and people like the new religious right, um, which, uh, uh, you know, we forget uh, the um, fundamentalist and evangelical Christians really enter politics as backers of Jimmy Carter in 1976. Uh, he is a born-again candidate. Uh, he's somebody who really lives out their values, and they rush to support him in the public sphere. They quickly come to sour on him when they, they feel like he is supporting feminism and gay rights and abortion rights uh, and not backing uh, their socially conservative policies that they would like. So they flee from him and go to Reagan. But he's what brings them out of the woodwork. And so these new groups are coming out. Uh, and, uh, and some disaffected Democrats, too, the so-called uh, you know, uh, 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 neoliberals. Uh, the, all these groups come together uh, in the 1980s, and they get unified uh, in 1980 uh, around Ronald Reagan and his campaign, where they basically agree on a simple motto of uh, get the government off our backs. They all have different complaints about government, but Reagan really unites them around that anti-government message, and then ironically um, uh, becomes the head of the government. <laughs> Um, so one thing when I look back in the 1980s, and, and, you, and you're touching on this already, is, is the move of the evangelical right in, firmly into the pocket of the Republican Party. Um, and that leads to, um, I guess the word I would, I would use is a, is a mess, um, because you now have this, this religious um, group sort of dictating um, what a political party does. And you wind up with things like the PMRC in the 1980s moves towards censorship and, and and whatnot. So, 
so do you cover any of that in your book? Yeah, that's actually uh, a theme, including the uh, hearings on rock and roll music, uh, where Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister famously appears to push back against these kinds of regulations. Uh, that's 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 one story that is very memorable for people who lived through it, but actually captures some of the tensions that were brewing by by the mid '80s. Uh, the 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 religious element of the conservative movement is very very important. Uh, it is a connective tissue to the grassroots during the '70s, and Reagan capitalizes on this as he builds his coalition. There are a lot of points of tension between the '80s during the '80s between the Reagan administration and religious conservatives. Many religious leaders are complaining by 1982 or 1983 that Reagan really isn't treating uh, many of their issues seriously. He's not coming down hard on abortion rights the way they want. He's not dealing with the culture war issues. So it's always a a tense relationship. Um, But evangelicals are very strategic, uh, and, and they form this alliance. And there are areas where in terms of dealing with issues like the public culture, they're trying to push the administration and often many Democrats to try to tap down on the liberalizing forces that were unleashed in the 1960s uh, in music, in film, in television. And this is a tension that persists right through, right through today. Um, but, but it is interesting in the 80s to see issues like should there be left ra- labels uh, on records because of the content becoming primary issues on television and in Washington politics. Now, what fascinates me is that many of these same questions are questions we're dealing with now. Like in the 1980s, they wanted to put, put labels on on record albums. We don't even have those anymore. Now they want to do censorship on um, social media. Um, so it seems like there's always this push by government to sort of want to censor something. Um, and I'm sure this was happening prior to 1974, but we definitely see it now. You have on the left, uh, people want to censor uh, social media because they think that, you know, it's Russian trolls that cost them the election in 2016. And then on the other hand, you have people on the right who want to censor things because um, they're hopped up over... Uh, you know, um, some of the same things they've always been upset about, whether it's prostitution or things like that, like how they took down Backpage.com and whatnot. Right, so there there is a move for censorship there, but I think it's, it's important you've got your hands on, on some of the big issues there. Uh, there's also a, the, the, a counter trend, which is that we see a move in some ways away from government regulation and control, and so a, a flourishing of a variety of, of media outlets. Uh, and, and that's its own set of problems. So thanks to the 1980s with the, uh, the, the death of the so-called fairness doctrine in 1987. This had been something to speak back to that earlier era in which there was this kind of mainstream media. Since 1949, the fairness doctrine had been a, uh, a policy of the, of the FCC, which said that if, you, uh, if, if you're on the, the public airwaves on television or radio and you're addressing a, a controversial subject, you have to present both sides of the issue. Uh, it, it was meant to encourage debate, but in practice it actually stifled uh, debate because it led most broadcasters to avoid controversial topics and, and play it down the middle. Uh, the Reagan administration does away with the Fairness Doctrine in 1987 uh, on the argument that uh, technology has moved beyond this. You've got cable TV now, and so there's not just the big three broadcast uh, networks. Uh, there are a variety of options. They say, let's let every opinion flourish out there on, in their own way. And this is where we get the rise first of of talk radio, uh, people like Rush Limbaugh, you get then the rise of conservative uh, cable shows like uh, on, on Fox News, and there's a proliferation here of, uh, of new sources, and that leads to uh, a desire uh, not to censor one another, but rather uh, simply to ignore one another. You can move off and find your own uh, pocket of the conversation where you only hear people who already agree with you, uh, and that's a different uh, bend of a national uh, national debate. I think a lot of this. I mean, I mean, obviously, as you point out, you have this changing media structure, um, so that people can create their own little environment. But what's that? I think what that has done um, is to give everybody 
you know, the ability to follow their own dispositions in the way they couldn't before. So now they can pick the news they want and hear the truth they want and be immersed in it. And even when, you know, disconfirming evidence comes out somewhere else, they can completely ignore it because the news that they are choosing is going to cater to them. And it's going to keep telling them what they want to hear. And we see so many episodes um, of that now where, you know, if people are shown something they don't like, well, they just jump back into the, you know, to their own chosen station and then and they tell them what they want. I mean, how, how much of, of the disintegration of the, you know, what used to be the mainstream news do you think is contributing to our current problems? Well, that that is a big storyline. And so the change in the media, the news media, goes hand in hand with the changes in how uh, our political system works. And uh, it starts with cable, which creates this 24-hour news cycle and endless space for different kinds of channels, which is a contrast when only a few networks really had access to the airwaves. Uh, it then accelerates in the 1990s, where in journalism, uh, you have partisanship becomes uh, a legitimate partisan news, become a legitimate part of the business, and we talk about Fox News. And then social media does what uh, cable had done, but, but at a much bigger level in terms of how the technology fragments and divides and, and creates open space in some ways, uh, for everyone who has access. And one result of that is is we have a, si- a world of siloed news information and political information where it is very easy uh, for people to actively stay in the realm of news that makes them comfortable and where stories that they're seeing online or on screen simply reify the positions they already have. Uh, and it's also now we're learning really through mechanisms such as Facebook and, and Twitter it's easy for the producers of, of these social media to keep feeding our preferences, to keep giving us news streams that fit into these pre-existing biases. And so this is a really important phenomenon. And uh, it's as important as what happens in Washington if we under, want to understand why the divisions are so stark. We don't even have fundamental agreement now on the basic facts. Uh, so we are well beyond debating the issues to debating what the basic issue even is. And, and I think that has created a pretty dangerous world, and one where all the talk of bipartisanship and compromise is really impossible when much of the public isn't even seeing the same thing anymore. So, so when you talk about that and you see students and younger people now um, – do you see that these rifts are going to get better with the new generation, or is it just going to continue like it seems to have always been? I think we'll always have these kind of rifts. Uh, the, the the key is is what do we do uh, to try to mitigate them? Uh, and again, this this period we we've been living in these last four decades really sees a lot of institutional forces encouraging these rifts and, and not uh, enough to push back against them. Uh, one of the things that we talk about in the book, which I, I think uh, does give some hope, is that despite how things might seem to be polarized or, or, or frozen or, or, or not really getting anything done in terms of Washington, D.C., if you look at the grassroots, you can always see social movement bubbling up uh, from the grassroots to change things and to put things on the national agenda uh, to shift uh, the conversation in meaningful ways. And so I think we're starting to see the, the signs of some of those new kinds of movements, the Me Too movement. Uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, think about what the Parkland High School students have done in terms of um, changing the gun debate, or what uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez has done uh, in terms of shifting the window on how we think about marginal tax rates. Right? I mean, that's a, that's a conversation that would have been unimaginable a, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so there, there's there's always going to be uh, changes here, and and hopefully they'll uh, they'll be able to break through some of this uh, gridlock. So how do you think these changes, um, you know, or these divisions um, brought us Donald Trump? Well, I, I think there we just we, we wrote the book and finished most of the book before he was a candidate. And so we added at the end a, a chapter about the connection of our story to his success uh, or to his election and presidency and then a little epilogue about what happened in the first year, which will update in the future. 
But there is a direct connection. He is a very much a product of this polarized age of politics. He is a president uh, who is very explicit uh, and uh, and devoted to playing to the partisan elements of our system. He has little interest in trying to build bipartisan coalitions. He understands or senses the value of simply trying to keep Republicans loyal and to play into the idea uh, in his own party that it's better to have him in office, whatever he does, than to have a Democrat. Uh, that's a fundamental way of thinking in a very polarized era. And he throws issues out all the time that fit pretty well with where the Republican Party has evolved in the last 10 years on issues like immigration. So uh, he is, a, in some ways, logical culmination. And he practices a kind of partisanship which has become much more common in, in the last two decades. Government shutdowns, for example, have been uh, used since Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House in 1995 and 96 as a tactic that's legitimate in budget negotiations. Uh, we saw the Tea Party use uh, threatening, threatening not to raise the debt ceiling as a legitimate form of political bargaining. And so when he takes these steps, it's not a total surprise. And it's not a surprise that he has some support on the Hill, a lot of support on the Hill for what he's doing. And the other part where you obviously see the connection between him and, and the development since the 70s is his very close relationship with the conservative media. It is his outlet for information gathering. I think he depends on Fox News probably as much as, as many of his advisors uh, or the memos that come his way. And he has used Fox News uh, and often fueled the news through his Twitter account uh, because he understands that he can get his side of the story out through this partisan media ecosystem that has been built since Fox went on the air in 1996 and, and on online sites as well. So uh, he might be extreme in a lot of what he does. He might be far more unconventional uh, or unstable than many Republicans, but he is not a total outlier, and he fits very well in the story we're trying to tell. So you, you 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 bring up Fox quite a bit, and you know Fox is an interesting story because when they popped up, I mean they were very much there to to serve what was an underserved market. I mean conservatives believed that they weren't getting the news that they wanted because they thought it was all slanted to the left. So Fox was able to to come in and, and provide something that that these people uh, felt was being denied to them. But do you think that's also happening on the left, too, with CNN and MSNBC? Do you, do you think that the same market forces are sort of driving those stations to slant their coverage, too? I don't think it's necessarily driving them to, to slant their coverage. It, it, it's certainly, to, to some degree, it's not nearly as pronounced. Um, uh, the overlap between uh, Fox News and, and first the Bush administration, uh, or the, the George W. Bush administration during the Iraq War, where they were um, uh, almost literally cheerleaders for the war, took the government's name for, uh, for, the, for the Iraq War, used it to highlight their own broadcast, kind of openly describing uh, them trying to give a what they called a pro-American slant. Uh, and what we've seen with Fox News, especially today, in which the president is uh, you know, uh, uh, calling into Fox and Friends all the time, uh, having you know, Sean Hannity and others uh, uh, um, uh, advise this administration, literally taking Bill Shine, who's the executive of Fox News, and making him the head of his White House communications department. I mean, they're virtually uh, uh, indistinguishable. Um, if you compare that to what's going on on the left, it's not quite as pronounced. Uh, there was a lot of criticism uh, on MSNBC of the Obama administration on things like, uh, its handling of uh, of Afghanistan, its use of drones, its inability to push for a for single payer on health care, on and on. Uh, so it's not quite the same. Uh, I think there is an effort uh, to try to replicate that and speak to an audience on the left, but uh, it's not quite as much uh, in lockstep as the conservative media really has become with conservative politics. But, I mean, you would have to admit that those stations, I mean, I don't know how much CNN, but certainly MSNBC. I mean, if you're watching the nighttime programming, I mean, those um, now are, are, you know, very anti-Republican. 
and 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 very pro democrat i mean they may they may disagree from party you know from party orthodoxy on some particular issues but overall you wouldn't say oh this is these, these news outlets are are balanced or friendly to republican viewers no I, and i think we we do try we talk about partisan news not just fox news and and we do to look at the phenomenon since the 1990s when this is really uh, having a big impact on all forms of journalism and on different outlets. And certainly during the Bush administration, George W. Bush, you, you see some uh, more liberal outlets like MSNBC gaining more traction than they had before. There have been a lot of failed efforts uh, to develop stations, radio stations like Air America, uh, and even TV stations that lean to the left. And, and some of that starts to take form in the blogosphere. You see... Uh, more uh, success for liberal sites uh, that are often pioneering a, a new way to do liberal partisan news. Um, and so that's certainly there. I think two really interesting differences. One is the scale and scope of what Fox has accomplished, uh, I think, is pretty remarkable. Not simply its viewership and the kind of revenue it generates, but its sheer presence and weight in the world of Republican politics slash conservative politics, I think is still unrivaled. I don't think MSNBC has uh, reached that point uh, in terms of the influence it can have. And, and that's a notable difference between the two networks. And also one really interesting aspect of this that a lot of social scientists have looked at is how do viewers uh, and listeners and readers take the news from these sources? And one of the most phenomenal and very consistent findings is conservative viewers tend to be much more believing or much more loyal to these kinds of networks, whereas liberals tend to be more skeptical even of networks that are sympathetic to their own points of view. So that also just adds to, to the ways in which the conservative media has been more successful, really, in achieving its goals. But but we're arguing it, it is everywhere. There's There's efforts to... To, cre to create this kind of news because it is a norm, an accepted norm of, an our, of our era. The old idea of objectivity uh, for many doesn't have to be pursued anymore. So how do we get out of it? Because I can see a future where this just continually devolves until people are essentially, you know, not actually brains in a jar, but almost brains in a jar because everyone's living in their own pseudo-reality that has no match to a shared reality, um, and in politics, that's that's not good, but it seems to be going in that direction. So how how can we escape that? Well, again, we're a historian, so we're trying to look back, not forward. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll I'll venture an answer here. Uh, I think we we escape by remembering that just because this is the way things are, isn't necessarily the way things have to be. Again, the the book begins with these stories of the 1970s about the old order really tumbling down and a variety of new choices being made. And these are choices we make in terms of what, what we do with our political institutions, in terms of what we do with our media, what we do as consumers and as creators of media, too. Uh, and so there has to be, uh, there, there can be a conscious choice to change that again, uh, to embrace new structures which uh, don't privilege kind of the atomization of society and the polarization of politics, but really pushing the other direction. That's something we can do. We're not, we're not powerless here. So, yeah, I guess one of the big problems that we're thinking about now is the information environment and how that has sort of led to, you know, the Trump presidency and how it continues to devolve where we are. Um, can you think of a time since 1974 where we've had, I guess, some problems that are as bad as they are now? Since 1974, yeah. uh, this is or definitely this is definitely the worst. But there are other very <laughs> uh, contentious times. Look, I think uh, for sure there were moments. I, the the one moment I'm thinking about a lot right now uh, is not the government shutdown um, that took place with Obama, but when the Republicans uh, threatened not to uh, raise the debt ceiling. Uh, which would send us into default and which was causing all kinds of concerns over markets. And, and that was a really a wake-up call 
I think, for many citizens about how far uh, this could all go, how far this kind of partisan combat could go. And that was certainly, in terms of Washington politics, even though it's a dull term, uh, a really a really contentious moment. We have lived in the last decade through some very tense uh, protests and debates over issues like race relations. We write a lot about the Black Lives Matter movement, and I think when, when we saw uh, the videos of, of many of those uh, initial shootings, like Eric Garner, uh, I think the tensions, the tensions were absolutely immense. And then you can go back to the early 1980s. It's funny. People now have looked back nostalgically uh, at, at Ronald Reagan and, and see him relative to today as a president that attracted great bipartisan support and drank beer with Tip O'Neill behind the scenes. But the reality was the feelings were very hot in the early 1980s about where American politics were moving Many conservatives loved Reagan and were devoted to what he did and really saw his enemies, uh, his political opponents, as, as true obstructionists, obstructionists and problems to progress, while many liberals who were part of the nuclear freeze movement saw Reagan as a true danger to the country. Uh, in 1983, there were many of Reagan's opponents who believed this was a president getting us close to nuclear war with the Soviet Union, and never would have imagined how his presidency ended. Uh, and so we have had uh, moments of tension. I'll throw one more. It's the year our book started. And we cannot underestimate what it felt like to live through 1974 when the President of the United States resigns in the middle of his second term because of a huge scandal uh, that involved issues like the abuse of presidential power. Uh, and the feelings were really hot when this whole period started. And in some ways, I think they've never totally dissipated. They just are either either worse or slightly better. So is part of the problem here just that people disagree with each other, and sometimes those disagreements are just more extreme? I mean, a lot, I mean, but this is like all of American history is the story of people disagreeing with one another. Uh, just that for uh, the, the period before this, especially, those disagreements started from the same set of facts. Uh, what's happened now with the fractured media landscape is that different sets of Americans are starting off with what they assume to be the facts, uh, which may not be the same set of facts, and so they're starting. Uh, from very different positions, and it's, it's, it proves in some ways to be impossible to have any kind of conversation at all. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess my concern is that that assumes that facts really matter to people in the first place, and it does, <laughs> I guess it doesn't always seem that they do. It seems that ideology matters, and getting wins for your team and getting your way seems to matter. Um, and then facts, whether they're true or not, are just thrown out there for... Um, you know, to support the case you're going to make anyway. Well, yeah, uh, we, we don't disagree with that. We do, we, again, our, our book is, is a history of this year and, and trying yeah. to understand how we got here rather than to evaluate good or bad. Um, but we have, we agree, uh, both of us uh, as, as analysts, that there are some pretty serious challenges our democracy faces given what you are outlining. And Part of this will depend on uh, citizens getting together as movements and, and pushing for better things. Part of it will depend on a new generation of leaders emerging, uh, both in politics but also in the private sector, in, in the media, who insist on something different and have the imagination to put together a different kind of offering uh, to Americans. And finally, I, I do think reform is something that's really important. We have to look hard at how our political institutions work. How does gerrymandering work? How does campaign finance work? We have to look at the media and, and look at how production decisions are made. Until we have those serious, tough conversations, you're absolutely right. I, both of us agree the history that we wrote is not ending anytime soon. Uh, this is the foundation for the next decade at least. Uh, unless we see these kinds of dramatic changes. Yeah, I don't see any, any, I mean, Black Lives Matter and the Black Panthers, are they not just sort of the same issue repeating itself? 
I mean, in some ways it speaks to, I mean, they, they were both concerned with issues of, of police brutality, sure. Um, I think there are uh, there are some larger differences there, but, but I think in terms of uh, at least the public reaction they, they've inspired, there are a lot of people in um, uh, 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 certainly in white communities who view them with alarm. We don't see the issues uh, as being serious. And, and I think, that, again, that speaks to the fundamental divide in uh, what the facts on the ground really are. Well, this is certainly, I mean, we could talk for hours on this, but our time is running out. Um, we want to really thank you for, for being on the show and talking about your book. And uh, we'll have that book linked as well. Do you guys have your own websites or things that you would like people to know if they want to get in touch with you? Sure. My, my Twitter is at Julian Zelizer, uh, and that's the best place to, to communicate. And then I have a website also. Uh, JulianZellizer.com. Uh, I'm the same, but it's my middle initial in there, Kevin M for Michael Cruz, K M Kevin M Cruz. That's both Twitter and my website. Well, guys, thank you very much. It's been interesting. And uh, the book, uh, Fault Lines, History of the United States uh, Before 1974. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. us. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.